Do you want to hear something absolutely silly? Did you know that you spend a billion dollars a year on those look-alike toys they advertise on Saturday morning television? And if you want to know why Farah is smiling, apart from that being her natural condition, she knows that her face is the hottest one in the look-alike business and her name is the hottest thing in the licensing business, generating enough money to keep one or two small countries going. The principle of licensing is that anything that's popular and profitable, any person, real or fictional, can be turned into even more profit. A t-shirt is a t-shirt, but a t-shirt flaunting Farah is a product. But the most visible, if not the most important product, is the look-alike doll. And that's where Farah is, if you'll forgive me, outstripping her rivals. To begin, let's go back to a former queen of the five to ten-year-olds. Ladies and gentlemen, Share. To rain and snow or sleet or hail, it takes a screaming demon woman to deliver her mail. How much money did you pay her? Well, what if we paid her? It was a pleasure. I know, but how much? We paid her in excess of a million dollars. Marty Abrams is the president of Mego Toys, a company whose sales increased five-fold after it started manufacturing toys based on familiar names. It's a business that must instantly recognize the difference between just a pretty face and a phenomenon. Marty, how quickly do you have to move off the mark? Instantaneously. It's almost a uh, Polaroid picture. Uh, as the personalities grow and as they develop we have we're constantly in several different areas attuned to what the marketplace is uh, we're attuned to pre-production we're attuned to summer replacements we're attuned to everything that's going down in terms of the media and to, to be there with the product in addition to the share doll which was worth 30 million dollars in retail sales consider these other items you paid 12 million dollars for the Starsky the Hutch and the Muhammad Ali and for the good Mr. Spock and his friends from Star Trek, more than $40 million more. But the all-time champs are the superheroes, Batman and Robin and Captain America and the Incredible Hulk. They and their buddies got you to dish out an incredible $50 million. Marty, what's next? I know your big success right now is the Faradol, correct? That's correct. It's been terrific. How well is that doing? Sensational. Sensational. Uh... I think the key item in the line is that Farrah Makeup Center that's over my, over my shoulder. I think we've captured the essence of what Farrah is, total glamour, beauty. Uh, the child has the opportunity to uh, apply the makeup, to curl the hair, to really get in and play Farrah Fawcett. It's been just sensational. How many of those? We'll sell uh, close to half a million of those. In? In actually probably three months. Who's the doll with the head of golden hair? Farrah. Who's the doll with the face so pretty, so fair? Farrah. There's a saying in the toy field that it doesn't matter what color hair the doll has as long as it's blonde. Stan Weston is a licensing agent. He puts the star and the manufacturer together, and he gets between 40 and 60 percent of his clients' take. Weston's clients read like a who's who of television ratings. So they tend to be people whose lives are other people's fantasies. Does it have to be uh, fantasy world? I'm, I'm, what I'm asking is, uh, could you market, do you think, a Walter Cronkite doll? Uh, probably just a Mrs. Cronkite. That's the way it is, Walter. In the case of Farrah, the market is somewhat larger. Weston represented her in the Mego toy deal, and the money story went something like this. But we told Farrah before the arrangement was made with Mego that we projected at a first year sale of anywhere from eight, nine million dollars worth of Farrah Fawcett dolls at the wholesale price. It so happened that it's tracking now at 10 million or a little bit better. But Farrah should see upwards of a half a million dollars this first year, her share of income from the Farrah Fawcett dolls. That's for really doing nothing but signing a piece of paper. I wouldn't quite put it that way, Morley. I would say that's for being Farrah Fawcett Majors. <laughs> for Richie Barry, Farrah being Farrah was worth even more. He's the president of Fabergé, a cosmetic firm that's infatuated with stars like Joe Namath and Margot Hemingway. But Farrah will be doing more than simply pitching products. The products she endorses will also bear the noble name. And Barry found out just how expensive a name it is. 
Farah gets a percentage of the profits, plus a guarantee, of almost $3 million. She's worth the money because basically in a deal like this, you're buying a name, you're buying an image, uh, you're buying a person who is instantly recognizable all over the world, and you're buying somebody that can get tremendous publicity and advertising for the product line. To make sure of that, Barry has publicized the Farrah Fabergé deal in the grandest Hollywood manner. Cary Grant, who's on Fabergé's board of directors, was trotted out to lure the press. And escorting Farrah was husband Lee Majors, the $6 million man. Together, in theory, they add up to the $9 million couple. In return for its money, Fabergé has first call on Farrah's time, up to 40 days each year. So Fabergé whisked her from the sublime of Hollywood to the less sublime of New Jersey, where they actually make the stuff. The troops were all ready for inspection. Fabergé shot this film partly to show that Farrah is not merely a front for the products. She's not just in this as a model, says Barry. Farrah is the chief executive. Oh, you've got purple on you now. What? Yes, from this. Now you have it on your face. Next stop, a meeting where the ad campaign for Farrah hair care products is being discussed. And Farrah issues her first command. I'd like the horse to be the same color as my hair. And whatever Farrah wants, Farrah gets. So bring on the Palominos. If all this seems a bit frivolous, it is. But the money is not. Barry told us he's spending close to $12 million just to bring out the first line of Farrah products but he sees the payoff as a lot bigger. These are big industries, big competition, but big potential if you hit right. So it is not inconceivable that we could be up, uh, you know, up to $100 million worth of business. In terms of commercial possibilities, this lady is going to be the next Farrah. So says agent Stan Weston. She's Suzanne Summers, star of the ABC series Three's Company. That's it. I have learned my lesson. I am through with men. Oh, come on, Chrissy. You mean to tell me that if Robert Redford came through the door right now, you would send him away? Yes, I would. What? Well, I'd have to fix my hair and makeup first, and then I'd let him in. Weston has flown to California to sign Summers as a client and to answer any questions she or her husband might have about licensing. Why do you think that... Suzanne is as merchandisable as she I is. No, I, I really want to know whether there, there are practical reasons for it or whether it's strictly instinct. I don't think it's instinct as much as the fact that it starts with that television show called Three's Company that she's starring in. That television show is making Suzanne Summers familiar and liked by millions of people. Suzanne, don't you find it demeaning in a way, though? Uh, I don't know, have your face in a thousand uh, beach towels, uh, all those sticky little girl's fingers on your image in these dolls. No, you get one turn, and I've waited a long time for my turn, and I want to maximize this opportunity. I mean, the, the, the reality is, if somebody said, Morley Safer, I'm gonna give you a million dollars if you let us put your face on a bunch of beach towels, what would you say? Oh, I'd think long and hard for maybe 30 or 45 seconds. That's right. <laughs> Over a relatively short period of time, if Suzanne continues to go along her way the way I undoubtedly believe she is and will, um, any one tie-up can bring in close to a million, over a million dollars. And put together the several tie-ups that I truly believe are logical, you're talking about an awful lot of money in a relatively short period of time. It's actually, it's, it's an obscene amount of money to discuss in such casual terms. Um, but it's certainly worthy of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> You're a, a smart, successful businessman. Do you have a, a, some kind of sixth sense that tells you that person, that's going to be it. We've got to move and license that person. I don't know if you'd call it a sixth sense. It's a sense that we, we find when we look at the personality. The personality has to turn on the children. and we, It happens early. It can happen in a single show. That's what we look for. Once you've made that decision, how much money do you have to lay out in order to then begin to, to manufacture it? Every time we touch a product, just touch it, just to say, okay, we're going to bring it to the marketplace, it costs us two hundred to $300,000. That's without the media. Once you get behind the media, the campaign can run a million, half, two million dollars. So it's a lot of dollars that we invest. How much money do you spend a year on, for want of a better description, Saturday morning advertising? 
Yeah, we can spend in excess of $12 million. $12 million. And how much money is all this worth? In what dimension? The sales your... volume? Yeah. We'll do this year approximately $80 million. <laughs> That may be the most recognizable theme song of the year, but it's just one of the multi-million dollar spin-offs of Star Wars. At a mask factory in California, they're busy turning out likenesses of all the characters from this year's licensing phenomenon. The masks sell for $40 each, and there are back orders for 100,000 of them. Here's how you satisfy the hunger for anything connected with Star Wars. Before the year is out, Star Wars sheets and blankets will be warming a million little backsides. Star Wars socks will be hugging three million pairs of ankles. The pages of Star Wars comic books will have been turned by 12 million readers. And the projection for these tiny Star Wars figures, not yet on the market, is positively out of this world. They'll sell for $2 each, and Kenner Toys is making 15 million of them. All told, it's expected that Star Wars merchandise will rack up retail sales of $200 million by the end of 1978. And that's as much as the movie has grossed so far. Charles Lippincott is in charge of all licensing arrangements for the Star Wars Corporation. At what point did you say to yourself, this is going to work and there's going to be a phenomenon? How were you able to calculate that? I don't think it's a case of calculating as much as the way to make it work was to get to our audience. Our audience is young people. The day after the opening of the film, May 25th, I was in Boston. I walked into the theater in the afternoon and three quarters of the theater was filled and there was all these kids there. And I said to the manager, is there school out early this year? He said, no. And I realized that this film was producing truancy all over the United States. And so what have we learned from all of this, from all the bad and the beautiful? Well, we've racked our brains to find some great sociological point to make. But what can you say about the Lone Ranger, R2-D2, the Fawns? And Sarah. Well, you can say they've become very, very rich. And so has Stan Weston and Marty Abrams and Suzanne Somers. And Farrah. And you could say we live in a mad, mad world where Chinese ladies in Hong Kong spend at least eight hours a day, six days a week, magically transforming a hank of lurex and a glob of plastic into mysterious occidental idols. From Hong Kong to Hackensack and back, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people are preparing and grooming, fussing and teasing, all for the sake of millions and millions of dollars. And Farah. <laughs> oh, God.